So let's really talk about where do we want to be in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years from now. Let's stop things like growing corn for biodiesel. And let's stop the use of palm oil. And maybe we can use the debate in the European election now coming up to say, hey, what is the goal of the next five years of European Union Parliament? Because if we continue like that, we only keep us busy. And that, that doesn't make sense because we generate an illusion. For example, for solar uh, cells, yeah, uh, if you take these, uh, these solar um, collectors, right now we are importing solar collectors from other countries and then we have a hazardous waste problem. If we just would say, hey, you, you only sell the use of harvesting photons, then you could use the best materials, not the cheapest ones. And we can give you a lot of examples. We now, for example, have windows on the market. We just sell 25 years of looking through insurance. We now make a windmill where you don't no longer sell the copper, you just sell the use of the copper. And it's much cheaper because you can just store the copper in the windmill instead of any Swiss depot where you have, we have now four times of the world copper production stored in different metal uh, storehouses. Overall on this planet there are about 4,000 to 5,000 storage places for uh, metals uh, where people are concerned about the currency, they invest in metals and they always pay uh, 1% of the storage costs, uh, of the purchase costs for storing. When we can put the copper in the windmill for 20 years just by uh, using for transportation of electrons, we can save the money for the storage costs and we can pay them even an interest rate of 2% for having the copper. So it's economically useful not to buy the copper but to buy the service of using the copper in that context. So let's invent all the stuff which we see around and please come back and say, hey, how can, what can I do with whatever thing you are concerned? We developed a TV set with Philips, which is the first TV set defined, designed for indoor use. Yeah, every TV set, it's off casing 30 times lower than of any other TV set. This TV set doesn't have any PVC or any other halogenated substance in it. It replaces rare elements like indium with new technologies. Uh, it has reversible material connections. It's, yeah, and it has, it's amazing. But what it's happening, Philips is marketing this TV set as Econova. And then they make it 200 euros more expensive. Instead of thinking about a different marketing strategy um, by saying, hey, why don't we sell just the use of this TV set for 12 years and we give it away for free because we only want to have the energy savings. This, this TV set is so amazing in saving energy that it would it save, it finance itself by 12 years of energy savings. Yeah. So you can give it away for free, you can put a deposit on it. Uh, but instead of that, they called it Econova, make it 200 euros more expensive for some students and teachers, but normal people don't buy such a TV set. Why, why do you want to sit in front of a thing which always reminds you of all environmental disasters of the world, Eco Nova? Yeah. So it needs different communication, it needs different ways to, to uh, learn from each other. And this Eco Nova TV was only successful through the internet community yeah, first, because they said, we want to have this TV. We, yeah, by crad cradle net, cradle people, cradle supporters, uh, 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 cradle EV, uh, all different in each country there are different cradle to cradle communities, internet which do, uh, do this together but at the same week when we uh, demonstrated this new TV yeah, Philips announced to close down their production in Brüche yeah, same week so if you don't change it now we know how to do it but we will not be able to do it anymore this was one of the reasons I came back from the United States because now we know what to do, and, it, and Cradle to Cradle is supported by Steven Spielberg and Cameron Diaz and Brad Pitt and uh, Susan Sarandon yeah? and Meryl Streep and all these celebrities. But for 90% of the products, we don't have anybody anymore to make it. Yeah? So we know what to do, but there's no industry left behind. People think they have more economic growth when they buy more stuff in China. Yeah? And that doesn't help us. So let's use our industrial base here 
let's make textiles, let's make redo things and learn from the stuff and make stuff which can go in technical or biological cycles. That needs all your skills and all your qualities. And then we will be successful. The sustainability debate is for me over. I think the, the concept of sustainable development as it was developed by by Brundtland uh, ages ago by now, I think we, we have to throw that idea away. It sounds very harsh to several people here in the audience, I guess, uh, especially people working for the Center for Sustainable Development, uh, for example. Uh, but I think the, the, the concept as it was developed is uh, basically outdated for the problems that we are facing in the 21st century. Let me explain why. Um, the basic concept of ecological sustainability for me is that we have to stay within certain ecological limits. Staying within ecological limits is basically what sustainability from an environmental point of view should be about. Now, if you look at the, the present situation of most of the important um, global ecological issues, you will notice that we have trespassed those ecological limits by far. And this is the case for, for biodiversity loss, this is the case for climate change, this is the case for the carbon, for, sorry, for the nitrogen circle. So it's, it's clear that, for example, for, for climate change, the, the limits were, were put at 350 parts per million CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. At this moment, we have more than 400 ppm. So it's clear that we cannot just continue the same kind of debate that we have to try to stay within uh, certain limits. Uh, the same goes for the ecological footprint discussion. Uh, every year we get the new report saying that we have gone a little bit further in the overshoots of the, the biocapacity of the planet Earth. Uh, that kind of discussion does not take us any further anymore. So for me, the, the basic new concept of the 21st century should be about resilience. And resilience is the capacity of a system of a city, of a company, of a person, of a family, of a football team, it doesn't really matter. The capacity of any kind of entity to absorb shocks without losing basic properties. So when we talk about resilience, in an economic sense in this case, it's about a reindustrialization, but a reindustrialization with a new kind of economic business model, a new kind of uh, economic glasses in order to look at this new future, this new resilient future. And for me, and this is where there is a connection with the cradle to cradle thinking, if you look at the, the six core concepts of such a resilient economic system of the future, which for me would be a combination of a low carbon, and that's, that's probably where we disagree, a low carbon, a circular economy type of system, for me there are six key elements in that storyline. Uh, I will start with the energy uh, story, uh, first of all, the, the most important um, solution in that context of a resilient system is dealing with energy efficiency. We are not investing our money at the right place, the right moment in Europe. We are still wasting a lot of our investments, a lot of our money. Um, the, the most interesting investment at this moment is still investing in energy efficiency, doing more with less energy by designing in a much smarter way and by using all kinds of techniques such as choice editing and new norms such as the, the BREEAM certificate for buildings is a nice example of how to promote energy efficiency on a large scale. Secondly, the energy that we still need to use will have to be based on renewable sources. I agree that we should not venture further in the, the wrong avenue of first generation biofuels. It, it will have to be fundamentally different. Um, so it's clear there, renewable energy is going to be a part of the solution, but we have to think very carefully at which type of renewable energy uh, solution. And thirdly, in the energy context, we have the story about the smart grids, and the smart grids is then the decentralized smart energy system where production and consumption of energy will be much better balanced. So that's the energy story. This, of course, cannot be decoupled from the material story. I think this is an error many people make. Uh, energy and materials are fundamentally linked. I'm also a material scientist. Uh, I work for sustainable materials management at the University of Leuven. Um, and without materials, we can't have this energy revolution. Without energy, we can't have this materials transition. So in the materials transition uh, framework, and this is the work we've done within the context of Plan C, which is the Flemish Transition Network for Sustainable Materials Management, we have basically three uh, core concepts. And 
I think they, they do um, synchronize with the cradle to cradle story. The first concept is the fundamental exercise to, to start closing loops. And the circular economy, closing loops through enhanced landfill mining, through urban mining, through new recycling technologies, which of course have to be directly linked, and this is the, the Yumicore example about um, the recycling of mobile phones at this moment where indeed several of the technology metals and even some critical metals are not being recycled because basically the products which we are using today have not been designed to, re to be recycled. They have not been designed to be recycled at all. They've been designed to, to be sold, but not to be recycled. So that's the fundamental second point, which is coupled with the circular economy. That's a radical revolution in design for disassembly, design for recycling, and eco-design during the use phase of a product. Only then, when we start doing that, it will also be easy to start closing the loops in a smart and energy efficient way. And then finally, and this is where the, the cultural aspect starts kicking in, is the discussion on product service systems. And Mr. Baumgart also referred to it. We, we really need to throw away the American business model, the American business model where we are producing products to be consumed, to be thrown away in an everlasting circle, which has to go faster all the time to keep the economy growing. In the new business model, it's all about selling utilities, selling functions, and not selling the products anymore. This is the business model of chemical leasing. It's the business model of Cambio, car sharing, very popular here in the city. It's the business model of uh, Philips in the future, where they will not sell lamps anymore, but they will be selling a service called Lightning, and, lighting, and the Lightning will be offered by products, but the products will remain the property of the company uh, offering the lighting. And this will mean that the way that they have to produce those lamps of the future will be completely different. If we invest today in these kind of clean technologies that we were discussing before, we will create four times more jobs than we invest the same amount of money in the traditional fossil fuel-based economies. So that's the first one, job creation, which is very essential to create jobs which will not be outsourced to China or India. Secondly, it's all about drastically reducing our energy and materials bills. If we continue business as usual, we will be paying more and more and more for our energy and materials which we are still importing from the rest of the world. Directly coupled to that is a story about the autonomy, uh, and this is resilience again. If we continue with the business as usual methods, then we will continue being reliant on Mr. Putin and uh, companies like Gazprom for their for their gas or on Chinese producers of rare earths. And again, it will bring us in a very vulnerable position in a turbulent world in the future, where, for example, China will at a certain moment uh, avoid the export of any kind of critical metals because they will need them themselves. And they will have these export restrictions for these metals. And our economy at that moment will be very vulnerable. And finally, there is also a major uh, impact on the health aspects. Um, if we invest drastically in these clean technologies for a resilient economy in Europe, it will also drastically reduce the energy, the uh, health bill that we are now still paying every time again. If you think about this, it's completely crazy, but every Belgian loses one year of, of healthy life because of the, the fine particulate matter in our atmosphere here. What are the mechanisms, the underlying mechanisms that can really put into motion uh, a sort of mo economic model that um, stays within these, um, or patterns, consumption and production patterns that stays within uh, the limits? And then I have two um, angles that I would, I would like to put forward here. I think the first one is if you... Um, have a look at, um, and, and Tom already put, um, um, shortly um, touched upon it, if you look at the way public finance is being um, used, then I think we have a major point in saying there is an urgent need of shifting the way public finance is being used, um, in the sense that it should move away from financing um, the, the activities that are uh, resource um, inefficient that use a lot of resources uh, and that are um, also um, uh, um, depending on carbon. And we should um, 
shift towards, of course, fu public financing, um, publicly financing the um, activities that are uh, depending on um, renewable energy and um, much more um, resource efficient ways of uh, dealing with our resources. Um, and on the other hand, uh, at the same time, we should look for ways um, to um, integrate the price, the way um, that the negative impact of some activities should be uh, more reflected in the price. I think about a carbon tax or tax on resources. And just to give some, some, some figures, there has been um, a recent study by WWF and um, Enico here in Flanders, and what they did is to try to see where the public finances are going um, on the energy uh, topic. And um, it's just been issued this week. And what they saw is that um, two-thirds of all the um, public financial support uh, for in the energy uh, field goes still to petrol, gas and nuclear. One-third only goes to renewables today. Um, Seven, eighty-four percent of state support goes to fiscal exemptions um, for petrol and gas. Only six percent goes to resource, uh, sorry, energy efficiency solutions, which is the way to deal with climate change. So there is a huge, a huge um, work ahead um, of us to change those things. If you look at a very recent report as well of the International Energy Agency on energy technology perspectives been issued also this week, they saw that compared to two years ago, a shift to renewable energy will cost worldwide 6,000 billion more than two years ago, only because of the fact that there has been more coal production allowed by governments and by political decision makers. So these are decisions that are taken today that are completely wrong and that are very difficult to change. Get rid of the fiscal exemption for company cars and the treasury will already have 4 million billion uh, euros um, more. Um, and um, also it's been touched upon as well, um, stop the uh, subsidize, say, subsidizing the unsustainable biomass um, as a, an energy source.